I'm very torn here because this is actually a very interesting juncture. Peter Thiel very famously said, you know, they promised us flying cars. We got 140 characters. Man, what you're looking at now is something far more important and scary than an alternate form of transportation. It is a genuine rewiring of human capability and brain um, that opens us up to being something totally different. Right. And so that's part of the reason why I just emphasize how important and powerful this juncture is that we involve ourselves in the conversation and take an active role in deciding what do we actually want coming out of this. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Festival of Learning AI edition. So we asked ChatGPT topics we should not talk about this in, in the series, and it said, avoid controversial topics and anything overly technical or specialized. So we're going to completely disregard that, of course, and dive into exactly those things with Mike Green, Chief Strategist and Portfolio Manager of Simplify Asset Management, and Nardo Manalato, Managing Director at Quibbits Ventures. Hi, it's great to see both of you. Great to be here, Maggie. Yeah, good to see you, Maggie. So we're super excited about this conversation. And Nardo, I, I can't imagine anything more specialized and potentially controversial than AI meeting quantum. So I'd like to start with that because we've already been having a lot of viewers ask about this. And just for background, for those of you who are not familiar, Nardo, um, with Nardo and his work, Quibbits is a pre-seed venture fund that specializes in scalable technology firms that are applying quantum technologies. And I know from our conversation at an event we were at in Barcelona that you're also spending a lot of time thinking about AI. So when we talked about doing this segment, we knew you were one of the people that we really needed to get in here to understand what's happening, where AI is going, um, and when it might meet quantum, because quantum is kind of a big topic in and of itself. So kind of set the table for us. Where are we and what's the time frame for this? Okay, yeah, thanks, Maggie. Uh, that's a good starting off question, definitely. Uh, where we're at with the uh, quantum and AI is uh, quantum machine learning is already, it's it's already been uh, done by a lot of researchers and scientists and application developers, right? So we have uh, people developing algorithms using quantum computing machines uh, from IBM, from D-Wave, these are quantum annealers and superconducting type uh, quantum computers, ion traps like IonQ. So there are quantum computers that already exist out there on a hosted basis where you can uh, actually start developing uh, quantum machine learning applications. These applications uh, that's uh, intersecting with AI are in the areas of optimization, uh, simulation. Uh, those are pretty much uh, the two areas uh, that is uh, more on this area, right? So in terms of uh, the, the number of use cases and uh, in terms of industry, uh, we have over, we have one website that's already tracking over 400, uh, 400 plus uh, quantum uh, machine learning algorithm that's AI based as well. So the in terms of how they're working together, uh, uh, we there are several categories of what they are. So one is called quantum inspired, which means you have a quantum machine learning algorithm or quantum AI algorithm running inside of a classical physics software environment. So it's a combination of both. Uh, you have what we call hybrid computing, where you have a, a classical machine, uh, AI machine learning algorithm running in classical machines, combining with um, a little bit of high, uh, quantum machine learning uh, running in a quantum machine and uh, combining their, their outcome results. Uh, we have those two uh, areas. And then there's also proof of concepts running in specific quantum annealers, uh, which are primarily more on the optimization and simulation side. So that's where we're at when it comes to the, the combination of uh, uh, two technologies. So would any of us, we sort of talked about how AI is has been, all of these things have been happening behind the scene, but it just kind of like exploded in our face because now we're all touching it and using it. Yeah. and sort of you know freaking out about it on the positive and negative are any of these things that you mentioned in the quantum world uh are we feeling it as individuals yet or is this happening kind of more in the academic research maybe deep corporate world 
Uh, you are feeling it in some sense, but uh, probably not uh, in too much yet, right? So uh, let me give you an example. Now, you, there are already mobile phones that's using uh, quantum random number generation chips inside, right? So you, you don't, you're not, you're never going to feel that, <laughs> except <laughs> you're just going to have a secure phone. Uh, there are uh, already uh, machine learning algorithms on the quantum level that's doing some optimization work, uh, but that's all behind the scenes. So you're, this kind of stuff is really on the behind the scene level, uh, and it's not really like AI where you would see, uh, you know, a front facing chat GPT or an avatar or something like that. Mm. Um, but you do, you will feel the the uh, the effects of it, right? So the thing with quantum computing is, you know, the AI is provide, providing the smartness, and quantum computing is providing the exponential type of uh, computability, and because of the way it computes things, it doesn't compute in a deterministic manner. It computes in a probabilistic manner, in which what AI is all about. So. Imagine a smart system that computes based on probabilities and then uh, pairing it with a quantum computer that is also <laughs> on probability. So they are just a, a natural pair. When you combine those two things, smart and powerful, uh, then I think the baby of that is really uh, fascinating. <laughs> you say fascinating. Some might say scary. <laughs> that's what that's what we kind of want to dive into here. Mike, come into this conversation. So how are you thinking about this sort of exponential explosion of AI? Well, so first, like most, um, it has somewhat exploded in my face, as you put it, right? So, you know, the idea that suddenly we are <clears throat> very capable and regular users of, you know, large language models, which are colloquially refused to, referred to as artificial intelligence, to create the equivalent of personal chatbots that allow me to do everything ranging from composing emails emails to composing long form essays to writing love poems to my wife, right? Um, suddenly I've become a much more creative and capable individual. Those of you who have watched me over the years know that uh, those are not exactly things that I would, would typically associate with myself. Um, so there's there's ways in which I would, would argue that like the toys of AI or the toys of LL, LLM are integrating themselves into our lives um, in a way that some of the technologies that we've experienced in the past few years, crypto is one that comes to mind, you know, really has not had that forward facing user interface and experience that allows people to get their hands dirty and play around with it and recognize some of the potential that exists there. It feels like, you know, this is a much more general purpose tool that can be used by almost all members of society. But at the same time, you know, what I would suggest to this is that we've only begun to see the implications of it in terms of productivity, in terms of labor reduction, et cetera. You know, candidly, I'm watching AI, and the way I like to think about it is that the past 50 years have basically um, belonged to those who would have been the equivalent of, you know, translators on the discovery of the Americas, right? People who have the ability to interact and talk with the natives to discover the local territory, et cetera. We call those computer programmers, right? They are the interface that we have between the, the traditional analog world and the digital world. Now those tools are suddenly blowing wide open and theoretically almost everyone has access to the ability to tell computers how to do things that they historically have not. Um, you know, what Nardo is highlighting in terms of quantum is actually fascinating because the native language of LLM is all about probabilistic prediction of what comes next. And so quantum computers that are probabilistic in their structure as compared to deterministic in the zero to one uh, format of a digital computer, you know, it, I'll be honest with you, it's a very scary prospect to think that we're actually taking a very new technology that we've not yet begun to fully explore the productivity and labor reduction uh, implications of it and giving it this new native um, platform on which to develop itself. That actually is is, is kind of, you know, that's, a, that, that's an interesting wrinkle that candidly I've not spent much time thinking about. Yeah, and I think this is why people are starting to sort of noodle around and are are focused on this. So Nardo, what ex explain to us a little bit more because people throw around quantum. I mean, it's one of those words, you know, it's 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 for some people it's very sci-fi. For those who are in the business, they they have a better understanding of it. So I want to make sure we bridge for everyone listening. 
when when you're when you're pairing it up and you're giving it a native home like that, what does that mean? Like it, we're already seeing. Uh, in fact, we the, for those who caught the first episode, we had Peter Diamandis and Salim Ismail on who did an update to book Exponential Companies 2.0. They're not even publishing the book. It's a live book that lives online because things are changing so rapidly. They can't even go through the printing process, you know, I mean, and w- which makes sense. I think we all feel that. What is the, what is, what is this going to mean for speed of change? If, if, uh-huh. as you say, you're kind of marrying these two, like very compatible smartness and the ability to exponentially change and learn, what is that going to mean? Yeah. So that, think about uh, the way things, uh, the way work is being done, right? So think about uh, levels of automation and levels of innovation that we haven't seen before, Maggie, right? So uh, for, ex- for example, uh, you know, the, the, the potential for creating solutions uh, will probably not sit within the human realm, right? It'll be sitting in the digital realm uh, because these kind of systems are, you know, from a probability perspective, can determine, you know, different types of optimized solution uh, on a more automated fashion. So it, it, humans are like that, right? So the the way our brain thinks is like oh, we're trying to optimize for the uh, for the uh, the best solution, but uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. There's a little bit of trial and error. Uh, with a system, you have actually ways to uh, not make the mistake by creating simulations inside the, the system itself. So one thing is, uh, pro- hopefully, you know, uh, when we get to a level of this kind of uh, uh, of, of technology, and the promise of quantum is already here. Uh, then you can see uh, the speed of innovation, the speed of system design, the speed of problem solving are all, uh, that's the kind of work that we will we will be doing uh, interfacing with these systems. And then the other part is the, the kind of automation that we can expect uh, w- would be fascinating. Things will be like, your building will be a robot. Your house, uh, your smart home will be a, a, in a, an automated robot uh, uh, powered by these type of systems are all going to be possible. So, so my perspective on it is like there's a lot of promise in solving so many different issues we have in energy, climate, uh, food, uh, um, uh, water. We have so many uh, potential good for it. But we have so many also misuse, potential misuse of this level of technology just because uh, you can do it. Yeah. Okay. I just want to... Let me ask you, let me actually ask Nardo a question because one of the things that he brought up is is this idea of automation in the home, which is to me, one of the primary mechanisms that we're ultimately going to see this play through, whether it's Alexa type applications or self-monitoring thermometers or temperature gauges, et cetera. Um, when you think about this type of dynamic, one of the things that jumps out at me is the regulatory framework that many of the leaders in the AI space are actually pushing for very rapidly. And I, you know, I'm known for the expression, why are you reading this now? My immediate reaction to what I'm hearing coming out of the open AIs, et cetera, is a reaction to the Google memo that points out that they're going to lose, right? Google has self-assessed and said, we're going to lose this battle. Open AI is going to lose this battle because open source AI is where it's all at. Um, They can move faster. They can break things faster. They can play around faster. I'm seeing this, you know, I'm seeing this push for regulation as effectively a plea to protect the early entrants more than I am seeing it as a plea to protect the public. What's your reaction to that? Yeah, that's a that's a very uh, highly contested question, Mike. Right. So uh, my my perspective on that is uh, I think there's definitely both uh, there's both right they're both right right. So in, in one aspect, this kind of technology uh, will definitely surpass. Um, and they're, you know, open source and regulations, uh, you know, will will definitely surpass a lot of what the private uh, industry is doing, just because of, of the nature of open source. But but the 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 issue with open source is um, without regulations, is everybody can have it, everybody can create their own large language models and uh, capabilities, and so you're going to come across a, a what we call. A, uh, out of control type scenario, right? So the out of control type scenario is what we want to avoid, right? Because the the issue with the out of control is like uh, you, you don't know who's using it. So the I think part of what we need to look at and monitor is 
uh, who is actually downloading this open source? What is the actual work being done by uh, fragmenting each of the branches that's happening within uh, this kind of work? And so we need to kind of look at it from that standpoint. Uh, disruption is not uh, is not bad, you know. So we can improve and progress in in solving problems. Uh, but the issue with uh, over disruption is because we we will never we will never get to a point of stable state. So it's always going to be a chaotic environment from a technology innovation perspective. And that uh, that chaotic state and non-stable state is where all the uncertainty lies. So that's the piece that we, in my perspective, we need to uh, take a look and probably monitor and then figure out what would be the right uh, areas to, uh, to create tighter uh, regulation on and things that could be uh, a little bit more looser depending on the different types of progress and different things that uh, particular areas solve. Hi, I'm Raul Pal, the CEO and co-founder of Real Vision. The financial world is a complicated world right now. It's a really complicated macro picture and there's a lot of risks. Real Vision and our YouTube channel help you navigate those risks. So subscribe now to the channel and never miss an update. There is simply too much going on. So subscribe now. Thank you. You both bring up really good, really, really good points. I want, I'm want i going to bring the questions in as they go. And I think that this is related. Mike, I want to come back to business model in a second, because that's a super interesting yep. disruption that I don't think enough people are talking about on, in, on the heels of that Google. Uh, Paul asking, this is related to, to what you're both asked, uh, both talking about, about that statement, that that signed 22 word statement by the nonprofit Center for AI Safety. Um, we know that some of them are testifying, Mike, to your point, and there's a question about what's their motivation for saying, hey, let's slow down, maybe keep it, keep the moat alive for longer. Um, and then there are, on the other side, these real concerns about what happens when this is loose and, and the fact that it's moving so fast. Um, and we've had people warn about extinction. The end of this is, do we need to mitigate the risk of extinction from AI? Um, both of you, do you see this as a space race or an arms race? How are you thinking about AI? Well, just very quickly, I see those two as the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't see the space race and the arms race as distinct. I think they're both um, fights to map out resource accumulation and, and territory. One happens to be the immediate barrel of a gun and the other one happens to be where do i get to aim the gun from right um so i i, I would broadly suggest that um it has been remarkable to me how quickly this industry has moved from leave us alone let us operate in private mm. to um please protect us um uh so that we can save you right um it feels not dissimilar if I'm if I'm making a direct analogy. It feels not dissimilar to the uh, wars over distribution um, in the electricity industry, where Edison was advocating for many small power plants distributing over a, a DC connection, right, a direct current connection, or as Westinghouse and Tesla developed. Um, alternating current, what we currently call AC, right, which allows much longer transmission, but a much more dangerous current. There were all sorts of arguments around whether AC would ultimately prove fatal to large numbers of people and why Edison built the electric chair to demonstrate how devastating alternating current could actually be to a human being. Um, we ended up solving those problems in favor of a solution that broke the General Electric and um, Edison patents and, and the importance of those. My gut is, is that we're going to head in the same direction, but this ultimately is, you know, the, this immediate call for regulation to me says that this is a utility, that there is ultimately not a real business model built around this that you can treat as separate and distinct from the public interest. And that, you know, we haven't seen something like that in a very, very long time. The internet is probably the closest we've come to it. That we have allowed to fall to private interests in a lot of ways. Some people object to that. Some people celebrate that. Um, this feels even more important, right? Because it's very hard for me to imagine a world in which significant, um, in, you know, intelligent enhancement techniques exist in which individuals do not actually have the capability to explore and play around and pursue um, their individual objectives with, you know, 
uh, basically toll driven access to it, right? I pay $20 a month for my access to open AI, which is somewhat ironic when we call it open AI, that $20 a month is simply not available to somebody coming from Kenya, for example, or Burundi or Venezuela, right? I mean, they just don't have those sums of money to participate in a world that requires that type of skill set. This is going to be a very, it's a very interesting social question. And I would actually argue that their introduction at this stage of the demands of the requests for regulation suggests that we should probably be thinking about the profit regulation side of it as well. Yeah, I just want to add on to what Michael yep. uh, said here. Uh, I think it's definitely a space race, an arms race, a resource race, Maggie, as well as a supply chain race. Uh, so if you take a look at the number of countries that uh, have a quantum strategy now, you know, uh, there are, I think, 23 different countries have put uh, uh, um, have provided budget to start looking into quantum. And what, what that means, uh, quantum is a criti- critical technology for them to support the space and the arms race and the protection race, right? So from a security perspective, but a big part of it is like every country is trying to figure out uh, the whole supply chain of wh- how are we going to create all of these different demands for semiconductors and chipsets and and uh, and picks and shovels as the, as they call it. Uh, And what about the critical resources that we have, right, that we need to develop? Things like uh, minerals, rare earth minerals, copper, you know, uh, silicon, lithium niobate. So these are uh, minerals that are out there that are mined. So if you take a look at that, right, so you have uh, powerful countries that can't afford to develop uh, these kind of technologies and you have resource rich countries uh, that are rich in resources. So how are we going to partner with them and collaborate with them? Is there going to be a, a little bit of a friction that happens with that in, in the race for resources to meet the supply chain uh, demands of these uh, you know, chip intensive, <laughs> compute intensive uh, industry? So I think we also have to look at it from uh, those two perspectives, supply chain and resources. Yeah, I mean, Mike, this is huge geopolitical implications. And I like that you say partner with those countries. Um, you know, it, it, in the past, that it, that's exa- not exactly how it's gone. And we're seeing it today. If you look at resource rich countries, um, this is a, this is, this has the potential to create a lot of tension, doesn't it, Mike? Oh, I, I think it absolutely does. And I think that's part of the reason why um, we either need to decide that this is a new base case model for how the human race operates. Um, where we all have access to it in the same way that we hope hope we all have access to clean water. But the reality is, is that it's a competition, right? And human species, the human as a species is inherently social and also competitive. Those who are not members of our tribe, we're constantly trying to gain advantage against them for the reproduction of our own genetic material. It's, it's just really hard to see that this leads to a giant kumbaya that says, you know, hey, let's all come together as the human race and, you know, move to that next level when there's such an extraordinary advantage that accrues to those who generate these capabilities first. Yeah. But let's come together to save ourselves is not is an argument that never <laughs> it might be true, but doesn't doesn't mm-hmm. usually resonate. Yeah. Um, Nardo, can um, even if there was a a, a a decision, let's just say in the U.S., for example, to uh-huh. say, you know, the uh, policymakers agree with Mike, you know what, I think this is about profit. We're concerned. We're going to regulate. We want this to be more of a utility so that there's more access for everyone. Just because one country doesn't doesn't mean another will. Like if this thing is sort of already out there. Is it possible to regulate it at this point? Uh, I, I think it, it'll be too hard now. I think with, with how things are being done, uh, I, I've never seen any time in my life where regulations were actually first <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. in terms of uh, you know uh, out there first before the technology innovation came, right? So they're always in a catch-up mode, you know, regula- regulation and compliance. We will never catch up. Uh, so in in my perspective, uh, it's it's a losing battle. Uh, and, and then every time that they come up with new regulations, uh, new innovations are coming out much faster. And now with this kind of level of technology and capabilities, it's even going to be more so from the innovation side. So it, 
So the only way that I could see regulation actually getting into it is actually they need to automate it, right? So they need to play the game of, you know, automated regulations as well and start bringing these kind of technologies into the mix and say, okay, well, let's go with the pace of how the innovation is going, uh, is happening by us using the same kind of technology uh, that are uh, out there. How, however, that requires a, a massive amount of investment, uh, rehauling of the work processes and uh, you know the type of people that you need to support these kind of technologies inside of a regulatory body. So just on that alone, I think it'll be uh, quite a massive uh, effort. That, that's an interesting concept because you, you said something before that I think was extremely profound and that we all really need to think about, that solutions are not going to remain in the human realm mm -hmm. anymore. So it's going to happen in the machine realm. We're right now talking about is it private sector that should have the say in this or should there be government oversight? Uh, is one country going to benefit against another country? It's kind of the human to human aspect. What about the human to machine aspect? I mean, this is where people, you know, go down the sci-fi rabbit hole, but get concerned about can the machine start to do things without sort of the humans? And when you're saying, oh, let's let's have AI say, how do I regulate AI? <laughs> do we run a risk that we're leaving it to the machines to regulate themselves? Or is that just fear fodder that's out there? Yeah, yeah, I, I think, you know, a, a big part of what we need to, uh, so there, there's no way humans can catch up with this level of uh, uh, c compute capability once it's like network computers, network quantum computers uh, doing uh, calculation, right? There's there's no way we could catch up to that. Uh, there's so much that there's, the, the level of data to process and the level of patterns to look into is just too much. And yeah, I, I think it's untenable for us to, uh, to do that. So I think the only hope is really, okay, how do we create, uh, you know, things like uh, maybe we need to create uh, new kinds of best practices on the design world, right? So I think I, I called it humanity-centered design. Right now we have human-centered design in which we're doing more of like, um, you know, hey, how how will a user feel about this? We have to empathize with the user, but that's a very individual perspective. I, I think we have to get into new practices like humanity-centered design. So designing systems that will have frameworks and fail-safes, uh, even though it's automated, uh, that so we still have some uh, human controls as uh, baked into it, right? So I, I think there's like, uh, uh, there was this book that uh, Isaac Asimov had uh, written in terms of like, oh, here are the uh, the rules for, uh, you know, from a uh, robotic perspective of, mm -hmm. you know, you know, never kill, kill a human, you know, th those kind of things, right? So I think those are the kind of things that we need to start thinking about uh, as we're get, we're going to get into really fully automated systems. We're doing it now, right? So we have concept in the blockchain space of uh, digitally. Uh, DAOs, which is a uh, digitally autonomous organizations. We have those concepts. We have the concept of, of uh, autonomous uh, software robots that are software agents that can actually do perform tasks for you in the background. So we're going to get more and more of that. So we have it from a digital perspective. We're probably going to get it more from a physical perspective as well, such as physical robots. Uh, uh, and you're seeing that you're seeing that now too, like delivery ro robots, uh, hospital robots that's looking uh, taking laundries uh, from patient rooms. Uh, you're seeing a lot of robotics uh, happening as well. Yeah, and, and some of that's been in the pipeline for a while, Mike. Yeah, I, I, I would just emphasize something that Nardo actually said, which is you know his reference back to Isaac Asimov. Um, there's also the very famous scene in the movie Contact where Jodie Foster says, "You shouldn't have sent a scientist; you should have sent a poet." Right. Um, <laughs> I think this is actually a really interesting point. When you talk about humanity-centered design, kind of the last person that I want to be in charge of that is Jamie Dimon or any other business person, right? Um, there is an inherent component here where we do need to engage the much more, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if I want to call it the right brain characteristics uh, of our society, but to say, what, what are we actually trying to accomplish with these tools? How do we choose to um, provide access to it? Do we choose to compete at the level of tribal? Do we choose to compete at the national level? Do we choose to do these things? It's almost like an alien um, race is suddenly entering us, which is 
really what we're talking about, right? We're talking about an alien intelligence being integrated into our society and an economy. And that creates challenges and questions that we really don't know the answer to, right? And again, I refer back to the 19th century in which communism emerged as a counterpoint to capitalism, effectively saying, you know, this should be a humanity-centered component. Now, communism, unfortunately, falls prey to its own internal inconsistencies. But this is what we're struggling with, right? We cannot avoid the um, move forward on this. Any scenario in which we say we're going to try to suppress or prevent the spread of this type of capability creates incredible incentives for somebody to you know, hide themselves away in a lab somewhere and solve these problems now that the outlines of it have been created and emerge as an evil genius, you know, uh, you know, threatening to hold us all hostage with the release of something over communication networks for, you know, one billion dollars sort of thing. Right. <laughs> um, you, you know, so so there is no way around this, but we do ultimately really need to engage. I think, the, again, for me, I find it ironic that those who are first out with this type of technology, like OpenAI and Microsoft and others, are are very quickly effectively begging for competitive modes to be established in the regulatory framework. I would almost use Nardo's words, you know, we've never seen the demands for regulations emerge as fast as they are now. That tells me something about the unstable nature of this business model um, and the potential for it to be, you know, just a total wipe, <coughs> excuse me, for it to be a total wipeout. Um, I just don't, I, you know, I, I, I really think this is one of these really interesting questions that we don't know how this is going to play out. It represents, you know, what uh, uh, Ray Kurzweil would call a singularity, right? This is, we, we don't know what things look like past this event horizon. And um, there is some, there is some, there's some seriously profound things being said in this conversation. So I know, I, I know everyone's going to have to go back and watch, watch it again, because you're absolutely right. And I, I, so interesting that you say it shouldn't be a business person put in, in charge of this human-centered design. Nardo, should it be a technologist or someone working in the technology field either? I think uh, when, when it comes to design, Maggie, I think it needs to be multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary type of uh, an approach, right? Because, you, you know, uh, humanity-centered design, it's, it's all about humanity and we are a diverse set, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? So I, I think we, it needs to be uh, different representations and, you know, what, what that is going to look like. Uh, it, you know, that's probably the hardest thing to do is like, how are we going to map out the actual stakeholders uh, when we're doing humanity centered design? I, I don't think there's even the practice for such a thing. I'm may, merely proposing it because right now, the way we think of design is very individualistic, you know, based on the user, uh, but never on, you know, humanity. I don't think we, 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 we never had this need until now. <laughs> that's, that's one thing to say. I, I think the other part to this is, if you take a look at so AI is being used a lot in cybersecurity, right? So which is which is great. Uh, quantum is also getting into that uh, area in post quantum cryptography and uh, quantum key distributions and things like that. So so think about a scenario where uh, let's say ten years from now, uh, all of our enterprises are unhackable. All of our government is unhackable. So it creates a little bit more of an open society. Right, so the the interaction is going to change. We're no longer going to be in this. Oh, what if we're, um, you know, we're no longer going to be in that very siloed mode just because nothing can hack you, right? Just just because of how quantum computing, uh, quantum, uh, quantum works. So if you if you have a more open society, then that means okay, you're breaking silos. Then that means that even uh, that means that the the level of innovation uh, will even go faster <laughs> uh, and we've never been that open before. So what, what do you do with that? So that means we're gonna have a lot of data, information, knowledge, network in a non-siloed manner. And uh, what what happens with that? <laughs> uh, there's definitely, for me, there's a lot of question in, in, in a digitally open society uh, that we have to think about uh, just because we can actually secure it now.
Uh, so so that, that's another angle that uh, I, I wish that we could also start thinking about, uh, not just about, hey, you know, what, what's going to happen within three to five years? What if, you know, I'm thinking about what's going to happen within, you know, 10 to 15 years when uh, things are, uh, the whole landscape is different. Mike, when, when, when I listen to this conversation, uh, and it's so important, it, it, it sort of reminds us that the things that everyone's focused on and arguing about now seem ridiculous. I mean, this is, the changes are this big and this important that it seems like policymakers everywhere are sort of completely looking in the rearview mirror by what they're focused on. Well, I mean, this is, I think, part of the problem, right? Is this, you know, Nardo, um, I think, is somewhat correct in that we're going to need a multidisciplinary and, and multidisciplinary approach to evaluating the risks and opportunities that these types of innovations ultimately represent. I think we also all know how committee design ends, right? It's a terrible outcome. Um, I can only imagine an AI that is put together by a combination of a general and a poet and a scientist and a mathematician. Um, it's going to end up satisfying no one and likely being uh, totally unuseful. I may disagree with some of Steve Jobs' type um, uh, innovations and the, the restrictions that he put around the walled garden of Apple, but what came out of it is something beautiful that many people ultimately have chosen to adopt, right? And so, I, you know, I, I, I'm very torn here because this is actually a very interesting juncture. Peter Thiel very famously said, you know, they promised us flying cars, we got 140 characters. Man, what you're looking at now is something far more important and scary than an alternate form of transportation. It is a genuine rewiring of human capability and brain um, that opens us up to being something totally different, right? And so that's part of the reason why I just emphasize how important and powerful this juncture is, that we involve ourselves in the conversation and take an active role in deciding what do we actually want coming out of this. Um, and I don't think it can be by committee or by by you know government uh, panel that chooses the path of this because the incentives are simply too high. Um, but at the same time, we need to place restrictions around it. And and you know the dynamics that Nardo is is highlighting, right? Unhackability, right, or uncrackability in terms of penetration. Put that in the context of the human body, right? What you're really talking about is unstoppable viruses. Right. Um, the innovation will occur on both sides or we'll go extinct. Right. And, and we'll figure out ways to police it and control it. And, you know, if you think about your immune system from the perspective of cancerous cells or of viruses, I mean, it's brutal and it's it's dictatorial and it's incredibly inefficient at allowing, you know, unmitigated change to occur. But if we don't have it, we die. Right. And we're dealing with with some of those very real existential questions as we evaluate this type of technology and the implications it's gonna have for populations all over the world. Yeah. Like that's yeah. a very serious discussion. So, you know, and it's interesting because I think when that letter went out, there were a lot of people who thought like, I, I, I don't know, uh, Elon I think said it, but maybe others did too about, well, you know, we've got to worry about this or it could result in human extinction. Hope it doesn't, but it might. But but it sounds like you both feel like it, it's not an exaggeration. It's that serious, this change we're facing, that that these issues have to be reckoned with. Um, so I'm less convinced when we talk about human extinction, right? Um, you know, remember that we're homo sapiens sapiens, right? So um, homo sapiens went extinct a long time ago. Um, we are the thinking, thinking man. And now the question is, do you have Homo sapiens sapiens artificial ancestors, right? Um, I don't know the, the answer to that, but we ultimately will go extinct in our current form. It's just a question of, do we actively choose that process or is that process chosen for us? And how do we choose to treat with dignity those in our society who may choose not to participate in that transition? Right, um, which is a choice that that I think actually probably should be available to people. Right, and and, and Maggie, we're we're only uh, you know we're only talking about quantum and AI here, but you have other things that is also a, a little bit of uh, something to think about, right? Uh, in terms of responsible uh, computing, for example, uh, biocomputing, 
right? So actually creating computing out of living materials. <laughs> Uh, that's uh, an interesting one, right? So in terms of DNA structures and things like that. And then and then you start pairing that up with, you know, quantum biology type of work, right? So now you're pairing it with quantum AI, biocomputing. You, you, we're coming up with very, very powerful systems that, you know, we, we don't really have no, have really not thought about the implications yet. Right. So we have things like neuromorphic computing. We have things like quantum ASICs, uh, application specific integrated chipset, where everything is going to be amplified and much better in, in doing uh, um, AI specific things, right? Or application specific things. So th all of those advancements. Uh, is is something that we need to think about from a bigger pic picture perspective. Uh, so maybe the bigger pic picture here is like, what is the future of computing? What what is the overall view of, you know, regulation, compliance, uh, and, you know, and you know, business and and, and things like that. Uh, wow. Well, um, uh, policies, ethics, more on that level, as opposed to, you know, hey, maybe it's just a quantum and AI thing. There's other things that are also a uh, cause of concern. I think this is the issue right now because it's all we're at a juncture where all of these things are now coming together. And when you say we, it's a it's a small subset of people who who kind of understand what's going on and are looking into the future and can see these tools. The rest of us are, you know, trying to figure it out and try to un trying to understand what ha what's happening. We have a sense because of the release of ChatGPT, but a lot of this stuff seems like it's sort of behind the wall for for most people in the public is that fair yeah uh, I, I think it's a lot of uh, because i see a lot of research and science uh, in in the field that i'm in right so i get to see things like oh wow that that is really fascinating so things like oh you can store data in your dna <laughs> okay well <laughs> okay what that's well what does that mean right so uh can i actually create uh, there's even Companies creating, you know, uh, biocomputing chips on top of like uh, classical architecture. So now you have living cells on top of like, uh, uh, on top of like uh, actual, um, you know, chipsets, uh, semiconductors. Um, so, so those kind of hybrid is, you know, hybrid of living and non-living. Uh, also, is an interesting uh, uh, view that we need to take a look at, right? So the whole area of, uh, you know, when, when people ask me, so Nardo, you know, uh, when are we getting get into, you know, uh, uh, into cybernetics and cyber? Well, in, in many ways, we are already there, right? So we already have um, uh, uh, enhanced humans in terms of like, you know, some people have um, uh, brain implants, heart implants, you know, uh, sensors in their bodies. So those are like, uh, you know, a, the definition of what cyborg or cybernetica would look like. And I think we just seem to, in a way, uh, just gloss that over. Right. <laughs> we right. just seem to gloss that over because we've seen it and, you know, we're, in we're a looking at the Star we're, Trek, we're not thinking about pacemakers. We're thinking about, you know, the yeah. full on cyber. Yeah, the full I mean, on the science thing, but, fiction but, has told us sort of where, what, where we're going. And we're just one, you know, we keep sort of jumping to there. Mike, one yeah. of the things, um, and it's, my brain is completely melting right now talking about trying to take in what you just said, Nardo, because I think we don't realize that we're at that point. And you can all understand why like Nardo couldn't shake me when we were in Barcelona because I was so fascinated by all of this. Mike, one of the interesting things while you're talking though, and there's a, there's a robust chat going on um, on the platform is a lot of, I'm picking up just a lot of distrust, a lot of everyone's just going to run and get and just get richer, buy a baseball team, sit in their basement, get seed capital, be a billionaire, um, what, what about truth? What happens to truth now? Almost all the comments, there's a, there's a, this is, this massive change is happening at a time where there's probably been a low, a historical low in trust of institutions that, that strikes me as problematic. Oh, I, I think that's absolutely the case. And again, you, you know, I would emphasize, you know, we've been there before. If you read science fiction, I would encourage everybody in the chat, go out and read, you know, Second Foundation and the Foundation series by Isaac Asimov to understand the issues that you have to grapple with from a societal standpoint as you face these transitions, right? Um, ultimately, uh, I think it's Foundation and Earth is the final book in the Foundation series in which the fate of the galaxy, the fate of the universe is effectively handed over to one individual. 
right? What is the decision that they make in terms of the direction that we go? And the conclusion to that book is, of course, him feeling somewhat uncomfortable with the decision that he's made, right? Um, we, ha- you know, we face an inflection point and a, the disruption and fear that exists within the ch- chat that you're dealing with is exactly what we're facing from a societal framework where we're trying to effectively herd sheep along a path that they don't necessarily want to go down, but may not have a choice of, right? And this is a very scary time. It's also a time of incredible opportunity. But if the great innovation coming out of AI is, you know, people becoming rich and owning baseball teams in their basement, like, man, what a failure. Like, seriously, because what you're actually describing there is, is, you know, reintroduced forms of human slavery in which people are forced to play baseball for, you know, a puppet master. Um, I don't think that's the path that we're going to end up going, but I can't possibly know, right? I am not that smart. I am not that for, you know, insightful and candidly, I, you know, um, if asked to place those, those bets or, or to make those choices for humanity, I would probably opt out because I don't think I'm qualified for it. Yeah. Nardo, um, I mean, it's it, given the the scope of the enormous themes that we're talking about. Um, it seems weird to circle back to this, but um, are what about the future of work when this all happens? Are we? Is that another? In addition to, you know, how we control this, how we find equity in this? Do we have to redefine what work means? Will 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 much of that be done by computers now? Yeah, we definitely have to redefine what that means, right? So we we have to also think about uh, new categories of work that we need to move into as well, right? So I I think a big big part of it is like, if you think of, uh, you have smart and powerful systems that are automated and can do a lot of the, and that, that's very, very capable and more capable uh, than, uh, you know, than many humans, what can you do with that, right? So, so for example, you're already seeing that uh, with the whole uh, chat GPT explosion of the number of startups, you know, uh, uh, being created out there. Uh, I think there's a chat GPT legal person, that, uh, there's even a wife, <laughs> you can rent a girlfriend uh, <laughs> even. Uh, there's even, um, you know, uh, the medical profession as well. There's a chat B- GPT version that's being integrated into an electronic medical record that can answer questions for you. There's uh, one in biology and life sciences. There's uh, and So all of these different knowledge bases are st- starting to have like, uh, you know, have an interface, right? Where before it's a little bit more ex- not as accessible. So what, what does that mean? If you are uh, able to uh, take a look at um, uh, take a look at knowledge in, in many different angles because you're connecting data in different ways, then you have a very smart system that would displace, uh, you know, we're going to have, I, in my perspective, we're, we have to seriously look at the job displacement issue. Uh, that's one thing. The, the other is the transition. What, what are, what, when you displace something, you need to transition them into something. That's the other thing. The other part is, it's not just the future of work, Maggie. It's also the future of education is going to get impacted here, right? Because, uh, you know, that that's a big dependency. You know, what they get, uh, what they get trained on is what they eventually get to do. So right now with this speed of innovation in the AI side, uh, if things are going to be, if jobs are going to be, to be displaced, and we don't have a clue as to where we're targeting, <laughs> where we're heading, uh, our education system will never catch up. Yeah, yeah, almost ever. There, there won't be a part, and I think this is a point that you're both been making. There will not be a part of our lives that will not be massively disrupted by this, and we've got to kind of think of it as a whole and sort of in, in these little tiny pieces. I think I just want to. I just want to um, relay a comment from Gordon. Thank you for this, Gordon. It's such a thoughtful comment. Uh, And he says, actually, I think the lack of trust in institutions is a plus. We're going to solve this as a race, not as individuals or governments, but we are on this ride. So hang on and do the best we can. (laughs) It's a a little bit of optimism coming in there, uh, uh, you know, against what are some really big issues that I would think, of course, we're all thinking about not just for ourselves, but also for our children. Um, As we sort of wrap up here, Mike, I want you both, to sort of answer this, what can we do to prepare? What can we do to prepare as individuals? How should we be thinking about this? And as investors, frankly. 
Well, I mean, this is one of the things that I've been trying to educate people on that, you know, our um, financial system and our investment uh, environment has increasingly moved away from anything that resembles the real world to one in which we are largely speculating around price dynamics, right? Passive investing is ultimately presuming that everybody else is doing the work for us and therefore allocating on the basis of what it thinks is the most efficient solution to it. Um, but we're not actually placing bets on fundamentals. We're placing bets on price, right? It's a it's a some you know a simulation effectively of what the world is, where the derivative that we call a stock has no actual claim on cash flows or anything else. Um, unfortunately, I think that actually is almost turned into a casino to distract us from the real activities that are going on in Nardo's world and other people's world as they scope out a world that looks radically different from the one that we're currently trying to pretend is largely unchanged. Um, and so I would just, you know, I would encourage people to think about this in the context of if you're actually facing low trust in institutions, if you're facing low trust in your society, the only way that you can actually fight back against these types of dynamics is by actively enabling yourself to build those connections so that you're more closely tied in as compared to stepping away. There is a solution set where a small fraction of people climb up into the mountainside, you know, in various gulch gulch type protected environments and hope that they can reemerge and come down. I think the prospects of reintegrating in society under that framework are actually quite low. Um, and so, it, you know, we are as a species, we're on for this ride. Figure out, you know, who you want to spend that ride with and focus much more on that than, you know, am I. Uh, making myself rich by speculating on the chip provider or buying into the arms race so that I can become part of a protected class. This actually plays out the way that I think it's going to. Owning shares in NVIDIA is not going to protect you any more than you know, uh, owning gold bricks protected you in the transition of, of, of prior periods. Gosh, well said. I, I want to flag before Nardo, Nardo you, you take that on, that um, we're going to be catching up on Thursday um, one of a, a part of the series is going to be looking at how we think about that, both as company executives and individuals, a little closer to earth. And what are our roles? What do we need to be looking out for? What are the pitfalls? How should we be thinking about this? Um, um, Buva is going to be on with us, um, who's been doing a lot on this from an organizational change point of view. And I think one of her messages is that it's everyone's responsibility, right? This isn't something that someone else is going to take care of. It's incumbent on all of us to sort of engage in this because it's going to impact us. We're all using it. There's no way to avoid it. It's not just like, oh, those technology people are going to going to think about that. Nardo, and I know Nardo and I, I told Nardo I wanted to be on one of his ethics committees when we were in Barcelona. <laughs> I was like, I don't know anything about it, but I, I think I, 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 I'm, in, I'm involved. I'm in it. I'm in the fight. But Nardo, how, how do we need to prepare as individuals? What, what should we be thinking about? Yeah, I, I think one one thing we need to think about from a you know more global perspective is we, we need to look at it from a country equity and access, right? So you don't want this to become like a global you know uh, a global race of have and have not, right? Uh, and, and then uh, in terms of that perspective, uh, because there's a lot of potential control issues we're going to come across and a lot of. Uh, uh, Country conflict that may uh, that may ensue because of uh, you know country equity and access. So we have when we look at it as a people, we have to look at it as a global as a as a global perspective and not just a country perspective, right? So that that's one thing that we we have to have that level of conversation. And, and from an investor perspective, you know, uh, it, originally in my thesis, uh, in in terms of what I invest in quantum technology startups, I never had a category of investing in in startups that are creating safety tools for these kind of things, right? So that's been a recent that that's been a recent move in on my end, uh, mainly because uh, I think uh, that that is an area that needs to get supported. Uh, that is something that needs to get uh, communicated out there that there is a there is a business opportunity to solve to create safety tools and to create capabilities that will uh, ensure uh, human security. Uh, I, I think that's a, a new category for me. And, and then the, the, the last one is like um, uh, on the education side. If we can get people educated uh, on not just, 
you know, because they're blind and seeing this technology. This, this technology is normally uh, either on the back end or uh, they're just seeing it as like, uh, you know, it's an app, you know, the representation of that, but don't know what the implications are. I think we need to have a bigger conversation related to the implications of such uh, advanced technologies. Fantastic. Wow, I cannot thank the both of you enough. This was such an important conversation to have um, as part of the series. And you're both going to have to promise to come back because we're going to stay on this because it was, I think, really important and answered so many questions and concerns that so many of the viewers have. So thank you both. Oh, you're welcome. Glad to be here, Maggie. Fantastic thank stuff. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. We are going thank to you very do, much. We are going to do um, uh, an AMA with Raul and David Matten today, as it turns out. And so I know they're both going to be really fascinated by this. So Roll up for that. Um, that's the daily briefing, sort of a special edition of the daily briefing today. So join us for that and we'll continue to tackle some of these really tough questions. But Nardo and Mike, just fantastic stuff. Thanks so much. We'll see you all in a little bit. Take care and good luck out there. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.